Welcome back to the Anti Meta Meta Club. This week's race C is another Group 3 race, and I think think there's a meta despite the fact that there are a ton of cars in the top 100 and since there's a meta i do think i found an anti-meta let's get into it the anti-meta car of the week is the 2018 gtr despite the fact that a lot of different cars actually work this week the porsche seems to both be the easiest to drive as well as the car with the highest potential with 29 different examples the porsche seems to be the most ubiquitous car in the top 100 Many cars actually do really well, but the GTR specifically seems to be able to follow cars through the dirty air just as well as the Porsche, unlike many of the other cars, especially the other FR cars. As you can see, there are many cars in both the top 10 and the top 100, but like I mentioned before, 29 of the top 100 are the Porsche. As you can see, the car is actually capable of 52s, but I was only able to get it in 51st place with a 53.2. Like with the Porsche, the time trials only show part of the story, as both this car and the Porsche are both much better in the race itself. It's really important to pay attention to the braking zone in T1, as you'll be able to see the track kind of moves to the right, so you've got to prepare for that where you aim when you start to brake. Aim a little bit to the right, then straighten your car and brake right before you get to the beginning of the curb here on the left. Brake in a straight line to the 50 meter board and then start turning in gently. You don't want to cause any understeer because you're going to be braking fully still, and not until you get to first gear do you want to start actually trail braking in. After your car settles past that bump on the apex, get back on the throttle as quickly as you can, but of course if there's any kind of oversteer, make sure you fix that immediately. Get yourself to the right of the track as far as you can, but when you get to the end of this curb here on the left right here, that's when you want to start turning in. After the car settles into the turn, you're going to lift off the throttle, downshift, and brake gently trying to get yourself all the way to the apex. The elevation and camber on this corner are pretty weird, so you've got to make sure that you hit the apex really late and you're really gentle on the throttle or you'll understeer or oversteer all the way off the track. you got to use as much of the track as you possibly can and you can use a lot of the track here. In third year, you want to track all the way out so your left tires are just barely on the red and white curb. As you can see, the runoff beyond the curbing kind of changes a little bit ahead. Three of the red segments before that is approximately where you want to brake and you want to be all the way back on the curb and the track itself before you hit the brakes. Immediately start trail braking getting down to second gear, then down to first gear as soon as you can, and you'll notice when I pause right here that I'm completely off the brakes and adding a little bit more steering. That is how you're going to decelerate for the final portion of this corner. Try to keep your left tires on the red and white part of the curb until almost the very end. We're going to get on the throttle and squeeze as much full throttle as you can until you aim directly at the roller coaster in the distance. At that point, we want to turn in, and then after the car settles into the turn, that's when you start lifting the throttle gently and then upshifting the third before getting back on the throttle, going over as much of that curb as you can. This green runoff and the green runoff on the other side of this part of the track right here are both safe, and you want to use as much as you possibly can or else you're leaving time on the table. Looking on the right for this access road right here, directly at the end of it, you're going to hit the brakes and immediately start trail braking in, downshifting to third before you hit the apex, and then of course back on the throttle as soon as you do touch that apex. It's very important that you squeeze as much throttle between that last corner and this next one, but of course doing so is going to force you out to the right. In order to remedy that, what I like to do is continue steering to the left and then gently lift off the throttle a little bit slower than I usually would to get the car to continue moving to the left before applying the brakes. The final red portion on the curb to the left is where I hit the brakes. Straighten out the wheel, apply the brakes, and immediately downshift while you trail brake. You want to get back up to third gear before you hit the throttle, and you want to hit the throttle right as you apex. I actually got on the throttle a little bit too early, which probably means that I didn't turn in quite early enough. Use as much of this runoff as you can, but don't touch the sand, it'll kill your momentum. If you've seen any of my guides of this track before, then you probably know I take this next corner pretty strangely. Aiming for the bricks on the left side of the track, when both of my left tires are beyond this grass patch and all the way on the bricks, that's when I hit the brakes. From here I try to steer directly at the end of the corner, right at this first apex right here, get down to second gear and start trail braking once I do hit that first apex. Dip down to first for a brief second, then back up to second, and right here you've got to be very, very gentle with the throttle. If you oversteer at all, it's going to completely ruin your lap, but if you can hook up the tires with just partial throttle, you're going to have a ton of momentum coming out of there. From here, get all the way onto the curb to the right and look for these tire marks. At the tire marks, I want you to turn in quickly. You don't actually have to lift off if you do it perfectly, but I felt like I wasn't going to make it, so I lifted about 10-15% to 15 just briefly and immediately got back on full throttle. As long as you don't touch the sand, you're going to be totally fine, and of course, don't forget to shift up to fifth. From here, you're going to move to the right side of the track, looking for more brick runoff as well as an access road, and about halfway through the access road is when you're going to hit the brakes, of course having two of your tires off the road on the right. 
Looking for this convenient white line right here, we're going to start turning in just about there, downshifting to third, and then downshifting to second just briefly before popping it back up to third, using as much of that inside curve as you can, and then of course tracking out as far right as you need to. We do want to get to the left side of the track, and we're going to look for this curve right here to indicate when we want to break and then turn in. You'll notice once again that I'm turning the car to the right, letting it settle before lifting off the throttle and then braking gently. Doing that ensures that we're efficiently slowing down as the car is already curving and of course, get back on that throttle as soon as you apex. As always, the sand is going to slow you down tremendously, so try to avoid that at all costs. When it comes to this little kink right here, you really just need to hug it to the right and then set yourself up for the next braking zone. Looking for the meter boards on the right, you're going to find the 100 meter board, and that is when you're going to hit the brakes. You're going to brake as hard as you can in a completely straight line, and you're not going to turn in until after you get past the 50 meter board. If you're understeering, don't be afraid to downshift to first gear just briefly, but make sure you pop it back up to second gear before you get on the throttle. And as you can see, you only want your right tires touching the curb here, and then your left on the second one, making sure that you're steering to the right before you hit that second curb as you go through that bollard. Minimizing your steering as you exit will help you reduce the chance that you're going to slide out when you hit that curb. Get up on this big curb right here, then look for the cone on the right. About a car length before you get to that cone, you're going to start turning in, downshift to second gear, brake and immediately trail brake in, trying to hit the apex right at the beginning of this barrier here on the right, shift up to third gear, and then get on that throttle as early and as heavily as you can. This car does have a lot of grip, but you can still slide out. You want to neutralize your steering just a little bit as you get on this curb, and of course, it's just a straight line all the way to the exit. This is one of the harder tracks, so be very patient with yourself. Like I mentioned before, right as you brake, the track kind of turns into the right, so make sure that you're angled at the right place so that when you brake, you don't have to worry about understeering off the track. P1 also has an elevation drop right at the apex, so a lot of people actually avoid it. You just have to make sure that you're not going to slip, and if you do slip at all when you get on the throttle, make sure you correct it as fast as you can. All of these corners require really heavy trail braking and very, very gentle application of the brakes, as well as coming off the brakes really gently to make sure that you don't understeer for the final portion of the steering as you're turning into the corners. If you find yourself sliding beyond apexes, you're probably actually braking too much. A lot of these corners don't require that you brake 100%, and if you do, you're probably going to understeer. Another thing that happens a lot with these really tight corners and these flowy corners is that you'll brake heavily or you'll brake appropriately, but then come off the brakes too suddenly or too early, and you'll still have a lot of momentum, which will cause you to slide beyond the apex or at least beyond the line that you're looking for. Applying the throttle too heavily here is very, very easy, especially because it's really tight. You've got a lot of steering angle and you're going pretty slow, so the arrow's not going to work as effectively. It's going to be a lot of work if you're not really used to controlling the throttle that much, but it is really rewarding and it will help in general. For S's like this, where it's a left fall by a right, a lot of times you want to just kind of go to the middle of the track. But considering there's a really long straight or a really long full throttle section after the right hand you want to make sure that you're really sacrificing the exit of the first corner to get a really good exit onto this long full throttle section and you're on that throttle as early as you can you really got to experiment with how much you can cut this portion of the track the chicane you want to pretty much cut it as much as you possibly can for the final corner a lot of people try to get a late apex and that is a good idea especially if you're trying to get someone slip or if you're just trying to get a really good next lap but if you're finishing the lap it's worth just apexing it right in the middle and keeping up as much momentum as you can once again we have one of the races where a pit stop is required but changing tire compounds is not required however with that said the tire wear is high enough that it does warrant a tire change What's cool about that is it's also possible to do it without changing the tires, but it is a big gamble. There are situations where it might make sense to actually not take tires, but the highest potential, the fastest you could possibly go for this race, will include you changing the tires. If you've decided beforehand that you do not want to take tires, then it's probably best just to pit on the first lap, then you'll have a ton of clean air, and hopefully at the end of the pit cycle, you have gone fast enough, even on the worn tires, that you will have passed some people without actually having to pass them on track. Now, this doesn't mean that you do not have any options, because you do have a pit window. I'd say it's probably safe with this car to pit anywhere between lap three and lap seven. For absolute best results, lap 5 is probably best, and lap 4 or 6 are both safe. The reason it's important to have these options is because even though it's not the kind of race where you just have to pit and not take tires, it's still really important to get as much clean air as you possibly can because dirty air is still an issue with this class in this game, and we don't have that custom slipstream that does give us better dirty air. 
With all that said, you're probably going to have a battle on lap 1. This track, similar to Monza, has a very high speed section followed by an incredibly slow corner. On top of that, the entire sector after that is both very complicated and very wide, so not only do people not exactly know how to drive it all the time, but they're going to look for any opportunity to pass, and your normal racing line is going to be different than your time trial line, so you may find yourself having to defend or halfway defend a lot on that opening lap. Either way, I was very happy that we were able to get away and get close to this front pack, despite the fact that we had some very fast people behind, because the GTR is, like I said before, very, very good in the dirty air. The Corvette behind us was going to be my anti-meta car, but after driving it, I realized that in the dirty air, it's incredibly difficult to drive. The Genesis X that you see in front of us is also very, very good. I would say it's probably similar to this car, but I don't think it has as good tire wear, and I don't think it's quite as good in the dirty air. MR cars do tend to perform really well on this track, and they do tend to perform really well in the dirty air because they have so much better turn in just in general. I mentioned a bit before how wide this track is, and that right there is an example. There was someone in the middle of the track, Velasa was able to get all the way on the outside, I was able to get on the inside, and there might have actually been enough room on the inside of me to fit another car. Another spot to really look out for is the chicane that we just went through. Not only are people going to be a little bit too brave, a lot of people aren't going to realize that they have overspeed from being in the slipstream, and so lots of people are missing their braking points. On top of that, if someone is really close in front of you, depending on your view, you might not actually be able to see your exit, kind of like what happened to me, and it's really easy to get a penalty there, unfortunately. Jumping ahead to the end of that lap, you can see that I have to serve my penalty, and unfortunately, it's at the beginning of that full throttle section, so even though it's just a half second penalty, I'm losing a lot more than just a half second. Jumping ahead almost exactly one lap, I am still right behind Velasa and Dino, and it doesn't look like I'm going to be able to pass them on the track, so my only hope is to be able to go for an undercut so I immediately go into the pits, despite the fact that it's only lap 3. Like I mentioned earlier, you do have a pit window. Lap 3 is actually pretty safe with this car. The car is actually 100% safe even if you don't take tires, but what I mean by safe is your pace is safe. If you don't take tires, your pace is going to suffer greatly, and taking tires on top of the normal pit stop is only an extra two seconds. You'll easily make that up on the track. The only thing that you might want to look out for that you might want to change your mind when it comes to taking tires is track position. If you end up losing position because you did take tires, then chances are you're going to be able to pass that person, and if you couldn't, then they're probably just at a different class than you. If you're racing people who are mostly the same speed as you, and you take tires and they don't, you're going to be faster than them and you're going to be able to pass them, assuming they aren't dirty. Jumping ahead one lap again, my undercut did not quite work out on Velasa. Velasa must have gone extremely fast for that lap when I was in the pits. Now if you've been watching my guides for any amount of time, you probably are aware that I'm really big on the long game when it comes to pit strategy and race strategy. Usually when it comes to someone who has comparative pace to you, if you work together with them towards the end of the race, then you can usually get in front of more people rather than waste your time trying to battle them. Now, one of you is going to come out on top no matter what, but if you both work together till the end, you can still resume your battle after having a temporary truce. I was feeling very confident today, however, so I decided to be as aggressive as possible, and I was lucky enough to get all the way in front. At the end of the next lap, I encountered the very first driver that I'd seen since I'd come out of the pits and passed Velasa. Carson gave me a very clean battle, but I was able to come out on top, but of course that may be short-lived because after this next corner, that's a Subaru behind us, and this is a very long straight. I wasn't quite sure what to expect, but for some reason I thought that he might just accept it and or just push me, and so I stayed all the way on the left. Now I definitely knew that the GTR could outbreak the Supra, and if he was going for a dive he was probably going to miss the Apex, which is exactly what he did, so I was able to sneak right around and stay right next to him. Going to the next corner is never that simple, however, and he went wide a little bit early. Now, it's hard to tell if he just made a mistake or if he tried to go really wide to force my line, but he did give me a lot of space, so I think he was just trying his best to go as fast as he could. Now, if this were the kind of situation where Carson was much faster than me, I might try to just slot in behind him and even push him to make sure that Velasa can't pass both of us. 
That wasn't the case though, because I did close 2.7 seconds on Carson in just that last lap alone. So I knew I had to be very aggressive and get all the way in front of him and kind of neutralize any opportunity he had to continue defending. If I can get all the way in front of him, I knew that I was gonna be able to stay in front of him. Velasa certainly saw that as well. By pushing me there, it ensures that I'm all the way in front of Carson for the next braking zone. And on top of that, if he's next to Carson, then he's advantageous going into that corner. And of course it worked out swimmingly. Both of us made it in front of Carson. Jumping ahead to the last lap, as you can see, because of my super early pit, I didn't have quite the pace that I wanted at the end of the race, so we weren't able to make any more overtakes on track. However, I did manage to stay in front of Velasa, and because of the pit cycle and our early pit, we were able to finish in fifth place. Even when it comes to having to take tires in the pit stop for the best pace possible, Making sure that you come out of the pits with clean air and making sure that you have clean air for the vast majority of the race is always going to be the number one best option when it comes to overall race pace. Thank you very much for watching my video. If you liked what you saw, please don't forget to like and subscribe. And as always, I'm going to leave you with a look at my current members. Thank you guys very much. I love every single one of you and I love you more than you love me. You'll never be able to prove that's not true.